Ciao. Me llamo Andrew. Today I would like to teach you how to find the intercepts and the asymptotes of the following rational function of, this is just too long for me to say, and we're going to sketch a graph. So the first thing is, let's look at the intercepts. All right. When you have to find the x-intercept of a function, what you're going to do is you're going to set the y value of that function equal to zero and solve it for x. Okay. So what we're going to do is we take this thing, right? And we got y is going to be equal to basically 3x squared minus 14x minus 5, all being then divided by 3x squared plus 8x minus 16. And what you do instead of the y value, you just plug in a value of 0, okay? And you solve it. You solve this for x. So you would cross multiply here. Notice how those 0 times this denominator just basically wipes it on out. So you're going to have 0 equaling 3x squared minus 14x minus 5. And therefore, when you have a rational function, you can just shortcut it and say the x-intercept, you're going to take the numerator and set it equal to 0 and solve it for x. Okay? So now you got to solve this thing for x. And it real, you know, we have this complicated kind of function here. So now what you could do is you can do a couple of things. Uh, you can use this program that we have in the calculator called the quad. I made a video on it, maybe about three minutes. I'll leave you a link in the description. Check it out, because I think you're going to love it. Watch how nice this is. So I plug in my A value. My A value here is 3. I plug in my B value. It's negative 14. I plug in my C value, negative 5, and watch. Enter. Huh. There are the values, right? So X is going to be equal to two values, positive 5, and X is going to be equal to negative one-third, basically. Okay. So we're going to have two x-intercepts in this problem. If you had to do this long, lo the long way, what you would do is you would have to use your quadratic equation. All right, You'd basically do, which is going to get a little rough, but you do x is equal to negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a, and then you'd have to go about all that math, which we're not going to do in this particular case. I'm sure you've done that 10,000 times. All right, so, so now what you have is you have basically two x-intercepts you're going to have the x-intercept at the point of negative one-third, comma, zero. All x-intercepts will always have a y value of zero and five, comma, zero, okay? Next thing you're gonna do now is the opposite. What we're gonna do is we're going to find now the y-intercepts. And it turns out when we do the y-intercepts, instead of setting y equal to zero, we're gonna set every x now equal to zero, and we're gonna solve it for y, right? So it's the exact opposite process. So instead of writing zero there, just write a y. And everywhere now you have x, plug it in as a zero, okay? Plug in zero there. So this was zero, this was a zero, zero, and that's a zero. So these terms basically just all cancel, right? I mean, this, this goes bye-bye, that goes bye-bye, that goes bye-bye, that goes bye-bye. So basically you're just left with your constant terms, okay? So y is going to be equal to negative 15, oh, excuse me, negative 5, negative 5 over negative 16. Oh joy, this is a wonderful value, and this is going to be equal to positive then uh, 5 over 16. So basically the y-intercept now always has an x-coordinate of 0, and the y-coordinate will be 5 over 16. So those are the values, okay? Next we're going to move on to our asymptotes. So the asymptote here is going to be, now we can deal with the uh, vertical asymptote. Let's do that first, okay? So when you do your vertical asymptote, what you want to do is you want to have both the numerator and the denominator in fully factored form. Okay, you want to try to have it in fully factored form. So what we could do here is just do a little guess and check. So basically, I'm going to take this function at the top, 3x squared, right? I know it's a quadratic, and since the leading coefficient is a 3, I know one of them is going to be a 3x, and the other one is just going to be an x, right? Because when I do 3x times x, that'll give me 3x squared. Now, I don't know what's going on here, plus or minus, and I have no clue what these values should be, but I'm going to make some guesses. I do know that uh, that when they're both when both of these terms at the end are multiplied together, they have to be equal to negative 5. Now, that could appear in one of two uh, ways, basically. Either the, well, maybe one of four ways. Yeah, because it's negative. So it could either be a positive 5 here, and a uh, negative one over here. It could be a negative five over here and a positive one over here, or then move the five on over to there, right? I mean, it's one of those, one of those three. But I realize that 
I have a 14, a negative 14. So somehow, right, I mean, I'm looking at 5 and 1. I also know that I have a 3 over here. So I, now i got to get close to 14. So I'm thinking, you know what? I should probably move the 5 on over to that point, over to that spot, because that'll give me 3x times 5. Oh, that'll give me 15x, right? And that's close to 14. And then I got 1 times. Oh, that's 1x. Oh, I kind of see it now, right? where you're going to take the 3x, multiply it by the 5, but since this is negative 14, it's, this has to be the negative, I mean, right? Because you need the negative 15, and then this has to be a positive 1. You kind of just reason it out from there, all right? And, right, and that's the numerator. Now notice here, this is the, this is basically what we found already. I mean, there might be a faster way to do it, but notice how if I set this equal to 0, it would be x is equal to 5, if I set this equal to zero, it would be x is equal to one third. And that's what we said we would get anyway over here in the calculator. So this is probably a fast way to do it, but you know, what are you gonna do? Um, now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do the same thing for the denominator. Again, I know I'm gonna have three x plus or minus something. There's gonna be x plus or minus something. I know also it has to equal negative 16. And I realize that like I have a positive eight here. So it's probably not 16 and one. You know, maybe it's going to be 8 and 2. The 2 should probably be over here. The 8 should probably be on this side. Uh, just because I know I have 3x times 2. That'll give me like a 6x something or other. You know, then this is going to be 8. Actually, um, yeah, that doesn't really sound too good. So it's probably not going to be 8 and 2. Definitely not 16 and 1. So maybe 4 and 4. Okay, so let's see. 4 and 4. So if I do, if I got like 3x times 4, that would be like a 12x, right? And then 4x and 4. Oh, right. Like, look, like, don't these, if I were to subtract them, that would be equal to 8x then, right? So this has to be then a positive 4, and that has to be minus 4. All right, that's how I would look at it. Now, the thing is, you do not have any factors in common. However, if you did, you would need to cancel them, let's just say, and then you perform the following process. All right. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this denominator then, and I'm going to set it equal to 0. After I would, after or any common factors are canceled. But since there's no common factors canceled here, I'm just going to take that minus four, take that whole denominator, set it equal to zero. It was kind of a waste in this problem, but you know, you don't really know ahead of time if it will be or not. You gotta kind of investigate it. So you you take each of those then. I'm actually doing these problems like, you know, like live. So this is how exactly I would problem solve. Okay. X plus four is equal to zero. And then you're going to solve these for x. You add the four on over, so you'd have three x equaling four. Divide out the three on both sides, so x is going to be equal to four thirds. And then here you're going to have, subtract the four on over, so that's going to be x is equal to negative four. Now, these are the equations of the vertical asymptotes. Negative four and four thirds, all right? So this is going to get a little bit um, fun let's just say. Okay. So now what I do, these are the values. All right. These are the values. Let me just get rid of this. I don't really need that anymore. So these are the equation. We're going to have two vertical asymptotes. Now to do the horizontal asymptote slash the slant asymptote, what you want to do is identify whether the function is top heavy, equally heavy, or bottom heavy. All right, and what you do is you look for the highest power of x in the numerator, highest power of x in the denominator, and make that determination. So I have a squared and a squared. This is an equally weighted function. If this was a three on the top, that'd be a top heavy, and vice versa would be a bottom heavy. When you have a top heavy function, you have a slant asymptote. When you have equal and bottom, they're both horizontal asymptotes. All right, if it's a bottom heavy function, it's easy. The horizontal asymptote is just y is equal to zero. When you have an equally heavy function, what you're gonna do is take the coefficient of the highest power of x in the numerator, three, Divide it then by the uh, coefficient of the highest power of x in the denominator, which is 3. And that's going to tell you your y equation. In other words, you're going to have a horizontal asymptote at 1. y is equal to 1. And that's it. Now we have enough information to graph, but this thing's probably going to get a little nuts. So let's see what we can do. All right. So let's graph this thing. I'm going to draw a set of axes over here. And try not to curve them. What's going on here? Is your brain on fire? Because mine is. All right. So what I'll do first is I'll just graph the x-intercepts and the y-intercepts. So we're going to have negative uh, one-third zero. So that should be roughly around here. Right? Then I'm going to have 
uh, 5 comma 0. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Maybe I should move this. I have a feeling maybe I should move this on over. Eh, screw it. We'll see how this works out. Um, then I have a y-intercept at 0 and 5 sixteenths, right, which is almost a little greater than a quarter. So that's going to be roughly around here. Oh, this looks fun. And then I have my vertical and horizontal asymptotes at uh, uh, x, uh, x. Let's do the negative 4 first. So negative 4 should be somewhere around here, right? I'm going to dash that just so we don't confuse it with the original axis, okay? Then we got 4 thirds, which is a little bit greater. That's like 1.33. Right, so that's going to be a little bit greater than 1 on the positive side. Careful. Just seeing if you're paying attention. And we'll dash that. And I have a horizontal, uh, horizontal asymptote at y is equal to 1. So I have to now do that. Okay, so we have like 6 quadrants. Okay, so this can get a little bit crazy. Okay, now what I want to do though is I need to erase the part in the middle in terms of uh, our horizontal asymptote. The reason why is because the asymptotes are going to, going to be basically um, met on the extremes or the, at the end, it, it describes the end behavior of the function. So in this area, let's just say I'm not too sure, so to speak, of what's going to go on, okay? So what we now need to do is I definitely know that I have a point here and I know the function will be combi uh, confined into kind of this quadrant, right? I really have one, two, three, four, five quadrants, all right? And in order for this thing to be a function, you know that it has to pass the vertical line test. So what that means is that if I have a point down here, there better be no point up here. Otherwise, then if it would, it would not pass the vertical line test, right? So I know that I have a function that's going to be confined in this quadrant, and it's going to look something like this over time, right? It's going to reach this horizontal asymptote. It's going to reach that uh, vertical asymptote down there, okay? The next thing I want to do now is I want to kind of investigate what's going to happen in this region. All right. So what I want to do is I want to see, well, what happens if I were to plug in a value of one? I know one, when X is one, that is, when X is equal to one, I'm still in this kind of middle quadrant. And I want to see what's going to happen to these points. Like I need a third point. I don't know. I don't know if this is going to go down here and then make like a little bit of a U-turn. whoop, Or it's going to maybe do something like this. So I want to I wanna try to investigate what's going to happen at 1. I know if the point comes back down here, the only way I'm connecting these points is like that. I know, though, if I have a value up here for y, I know now that this function is going to be doing something like this. Okay? So I'm going to investigate that at 1. So what I do is I look at my function. I'm going to plug in a value of 1 everywhere I see x. Okay? So this would simply be a 3. This would be then minus 14, minus 5. And this would be a 3, plus 8, minus then 16. Okay, so this works out to be a negative 19, and then you're going to add 3 to that, so that works out to be a negative 16. And then down here, you're going to have an a, a positive 8 minus a 16, that's a negative 8 plus a 3, right? That's going to be some positive value, and that's going to be, sorry, I got distracted because I thought I didn't need to calculate it in my head, uh, but then I realized I probably should because it could still be, it's basically greater than positive 1. Right, that's what we're looking. Uh, that's what we're looking for. We don't really need to calculate at that point, but you had a negative eight plus a three. That's going to be a negative five, and this is definitely a positive value. That's going to be roughly about positive. <clears throat> what is that going to be? Three point three and one fifth positive. So it's going to be somewhere around here. Okay. So now that I know that point, I know that point should be a roughly here. I know how to now sketch this thing in here. I know this is going to come on down. It's going to have a point of inflection, go on up. And that's kind of going to be what the graph will basically look like, more or less. Okay. Now, the only thing left I have to test is what's going to go on, what's going to go on over in this area. Is it going to be on the top quadrant or the bottom? So again, I pick a value of X, right? So one, two, three, four, five. So let's say I'm going to choose negative five. And what I'm going to do from there is I'm going to plug negative 5 on into this function. Okay? And I'm going to see what the value is. All right? And that once I know x is negative 5 and I can find the y, then I know where the coordinate is. Maybe the coordinate will be here. Maybe it'll be here. Maybe it'll be here. But it'll tell me now where I should be looking. Okay? So just use the... Uh, you could do this in your head or whatever, but just use the calculator. So do open parenthesis. You're going to do 3, open parenthesis, then negative 5, because I'm plugging in negative 5 there everywhere I see an x 
minus then 14 times then negative 5, then minus the 5, and divide that whole thing now by the entire denominator. So I use a parenthesis again. So there's going to be 3 times negative 5 squared, and then plus 8 times negative 5 minus 16. And let's see what we get. So it works out to be about 7. So what that means, now going back over to here, is that when I'm at a value of negative 5, for x, the y value is going to be 7, roughly, a little bit greater. So I know this is the point. Okay, let me put that in blue. I know that this is the point. And now I'm confined into this quadrant. So I know this graph is going to do something, something like this. Well, that looks like a straight line now. But I don't really have the best... Uh, It'll do something like this where it's going to, again, come down. It's going to trail on off forever. Okay? But that's going to be basically what the function should look like. So now what we can do is we can graph this thing. So go to your graph, y equals, and then we're going to have to plug this in again. So 3x squared, 3x squared minus 14x minus 5, divided by then 3x squared plus 8x uh, minus 16 graph. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. That's basically what we said it should look like, right? So hopefully that helps. And if you like what you see, check out our channel, because we have thousands of videos out there just to help you through your class. All right? Not only math, but chemistry and physics as well. We solve specific problems. We're going to leave all types of goodies along the way in the descriptions below. The best way to do well on your exams is to do a ton of practice problems. Don't just sit there and read your notes. You Got to read the notes and apply them to problems. Okay? And isn't it, I, I don't know, I was always frustrated as a student when I'd be like, oh man, I can't get this problem. I have to think through it for two hours. Sometimes get it, sometimes not. But we try to, we try to speed that process up. So if you're struggling with the problem, take a look at our video. We'll help you through it. We'd love to help you with more. Take care.